Thank you so much. Uh, so I know it's really cliche, but I'm a sucker for quotes about creativity. Just, I just am. Like, like this one here from Johnny Ive, formerly of Apple. We did it because we cared. Because when you realize how well you can make something, falling short feels like failure. I love that. Do it because you care. Or from Maya Angelou, you can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. Or from John Cleese of Monty Python fame, who gets practical when he says that creativity is not a gift, it's not a talent, it's not the muse, it's a way of operating. But my all-time favorite storyteller, my storytelling idol, is the late, great Anthony Bourdain, who once said this. It's not always a great idea to follow your passion. If you're passionate about something that you will never be good at, at some point you're gonna have to recognize that. But if you feel in your heart, if you know, if you have reason to believe that you can be awesome at something, that you can do something unique that will shock and astound and terrify people and bewitch them, do that. Right in the feels, right? And I find myself inspired by those words. I draw inspiration from thoughts like all of those. And then what happens? Reality hits. I go back to work and I can't stop asking, how? How can we do work we care about more consistently until it becomes a way of operating and delivers something unique that shocks, astounds, and bewitches people? How can we do that? I think it all starts with how we understand this concept. Call it what you will, creativity, innovation. I think we make an assumption that it's all about creating something from nothing. But we're never really starting out from nothing. There's always a status quo into which we introduce something different. OK, so innovation is doing something different, but not just different, right? I mean, here. I could give the rest of my talk like this. I'm different. I am different compared to every speaker on the planet right now. But am I any good? I mean, is this a different any of you actually want? Please don't say yes. <laughs> Look, they're just my feelings. They'll heal. So we're seeking different and good. Different and welcome. Let's call that refreshing. Creativity is doing something refreshing compared to the status quo. And that can be really hard to do consistently. We're pretty good at doing something one time. And when we do, when we call it innovation or creativity, momentarily everything feels awesome. We get great results and people love us and we start feeling ourselves. We're like, oh yeah, we're great, it's great, we're great, and then we keep doing it and we're good, still good, we're good, still good, oh no, it's flat, good enough, it's flat, oh my God, what the hell just happened? It was amazing and now it's not. I don't know what we're gonna do. Hold on, what did you say? Bree, what did you, you have a big idea? Should we, should we jump in a room and brainstorm? Or, hold on, what is that? Did you see that? Did you see that over there? Is that, is that a hot new trend in the industry? Should we jump on it? Huh? What do you got there? What is that? What is it? What is that? Is that, is this some sweet new technology? Well, let's do it all. Because now we're great. It's great. We're great. Oh, seriously, again? We just keep living through this same nightmare over and over again. We want to do one thing and call it innovation, and when that doesn't work, we panic search for the next thing, the next trend, the next big idea, anything to spike the numbers. I need the spikes. Just give me those spikes. It's exhausting. It's maddening. It is insanity out there, people. We hear the call to innovate, and our work devolves into this random act of creativity. We just keep pulling these stunts. We want to do the one thing well forever. And when that inevitably fails, we panic for the next thing. Our work becomes this constant game of manufacturing a spike in the numbers. This is simply unsustainable. And it leads to a really big question. How can we make creativity consistent instead of random? We don't talk about this enough as marketers today, but consistency? is sexy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, give me a brand that really knows how to evolve with me, because I am a grown-ass man. That's the worst thing I've ever said on a stage. All right. <laughs> Setting the bar low. <laughs> thing is, consistent creativity doesn't create one-off spikes. It shifts the trajectory 
of the entire damn line. That's pretty sexy. But to get to that, we first need to deal with that. That is called emotional decay. It's the process by which an initial moment of innovation stagnates as others lose interest and we lose results. Emotional decay. That spike we so crave is the local maximum. It's the point at which that one thing done that one way is gonna yield the best it ever will because people love it the most they ever will. And if we keep going back to it, we see diminishing returns over time. And if we're not careful, well, stagnation affects us. And today, we're great through optimization and automation and just maintaining results that are good enough. It's predictable. It's not great like it once was. It's, it's good enough. More than ever before, as marketers today, we are great at good enough. And if we're not careful then, well, we reach the dreaded crapping point. I don't know what happened. It just crapped out on us. It was amazing, and now it's not. They loved it, then liked it, then looked elsewhere, then left, and we panic. We tolerate stagnation for way too long until, inevitably, we fell off a cliff. Ah! <laughs> and if we survive that fall, it's this impossible effort to get back up there. So we gotta go big. And it's all because we're acting after it's too late. So if we're gonna make innovation a habit instead of a Hail Mary, and creativity consistent instead of a random act, we can't act after it's too late. We have to change before stagnation affects us so we never reach the crapping point. In other words, if we usually change after something stops working, what if we changed what was working while it's still working? Maybe then we can do work we care about more consistently until it becomes a way of operating and deliver something unique that shocks, astounds, and bewitches people. So how can we do that? Well, I don't know if you can tell, and I try to hide it pretty well, uh, but I'm an adult. And uh, one thing I recently learned that adults are supposed to do, apparently, is get adult haircuts. Okay, some of the men have no idea what I'm talking about, so let me explain. Fellas, if you pick your barber the same way you pick your underwear in the morning, yeah, that one. You're gonna have a bad time. And after doing that for 10 years, I recently decided to choose a professional barber because I am an adult man, and also, my wife made me. <laughs> <laughs> and the barber I selected was this guy, Anthony Barriola. He's in Somerville, Massachusetts, and he and his team run a little shop called Razors. The first time I went to Razors, I sat in that chair, got an amazing cut, and then Anthony threw in a free neck shave. Awesome, right? Okay, some of the women have no idea what I'm talking about, so let me just explain quick. When God made Italian men, he went, they're too confident, this is gonna be an issue. And some angel in the back went, make them hairy. <laughs> so now a free neck shave is mwah, perfecto. In other words, Anthony exceeded my expectations. Now the second time I went to Razors, I got the great cut, I got the free shave, and it felt good, but not as good as the first time. And the third time I went, I got the cut, I got the free shave, and it felt good, but not as good as the second time. This is the paradox of exceeding expectations. Once we do so even once, we've changed their expectations. What was refreshing no longer is, and in fact gets stale pretty quick, but then, three, four, five, six times into it, all of a sudden Anthony turns to me and he goes, hey, I've seen you here a bunch before. Uh, we're having a concert at the barbershop on Friday. Why don't you come by? What? He goes, a concert, like with music and stuff. I said, I know what a concert is, but I also know what a barbershop is. And how do the two go together? It felt like a stunt. It wasn't a stunt. Here's how Anthony and his team at Razors went from a great cut and a free shave to a concert at the barbershop. Let's go back a few years. Before I knew Anthony and Razors existed, I was still getting my hair cut at a very small French salon in Boston uh, called, um, what was it called? Uh, Supercuts. <laughs> great little French place in Boston. 
And I didn't know Anthony existed, but Anthony was going through a tough time in his business. He was worried that he was stagnating. His team was getting disillusioned and bored, and there's so many competitors within walking distance of razors. So he knew that if he was going to succeed, he couldn't let stagnation affect his business. He had to innovate, he had to get creative. And he would sit there at night and long for something better. When I asked him, what was that like? Here's what he told me he would do. I would sit there every night for literally hours and just go through social media and one cool barbershop in Amsterdam then led me to another cool barbershop in Argentina. And he thought maybe I could go visit them, even just for a day, see what they do, bring back new ideas and do something refreshing compared to my local market. I could refresh the work. And so Anthony embarked on a quest. First, he drove from his home in Boston up to New Hampshire, saw a friend's barbershop up there. Then he took a train on Amtrak all the way down to New York, saw a Carter barbershop up there. Once he was done in New York, he flew across the ocean all the way to Italy, his home country, where they make all those Italian hairy people. And he went down to Sorrento, saw an old world style, then saw something new world up in, uh, in Amsterdam. And the whole time he thought, you know, not only can I refresh the work for my team and re-inspire them, not only can I exceed the expectations of my customers by bringing back my lessons learned for their services, maybe I could market the whole brand. We could show off how refreshing we are compared to the status quo. So he filmed the whole journey. The only problem was his videos felt anything but refreshing. They felt kind of stale at first. His early attempts at video felt a little bit like this. And I'm bored. It's just like every other barbershop. That's not refreshing and different at all. He knew that he had to immerse you in the same emotional experience that he felt, if you were going to feel that way too. He thought music would be a great way to do that, but he had no rights to good music, nor the budget to pay for it. And that's when he got creative. He realized tons of musicians tour through Boston all the time. And he thought to himself, So why not bring them into the barbershop? because everybody needs a haircut when they're on their tour. At some point, they gotta look fresh for the show. And then I can record them singing songs that were done exclusively in my shop and use that recording as the background of the episode. And so he did. He brought in a few musicians, gave them a free cut and that great neck shave, and they played some of their songs for him. And he used those songs to score those videos. And those videos became known as a web series that Anthony called Anthony Shaves the World. I want to show you a clip, but just know that this is the episode where he goes to Brooklyn. However, the first clip is inside of Razors, where you see Eli Paperboy Reed, this great southern band, this bluegrass band playing in the barbershop. Here's a clip. Uh. And I can't run anymore. I will walk. Feel it. It's got soul. It's got emotion. And it conveyed the same emotion that he felt when he traveled down to Brooklyn. So we traveled with him. And you immerse yourself in the same emotional plane as Anthony. People fell in love with this series. By the way, Cotter in New York and in Brooklyn, true to Brooklyn's form, half espresso bar, half barbershop. People fell in love with Anthony Shaves the World. But more importantly, they fell in love with Razors. They have a huge army of passionate fans who can't stop raving about them on social media. They're the number one rated service on Yelp. They have 214 reviews. The second place competitor has 41. They won all kinds of local awards. They are thriving in an incredibly uh, expensive and saturated niche. And right there is where the typical innovation story in business would stop. Right? Person is struggling. They want something more. They did a shiny thing. It's working. And that's how innovation happens. Of course, we all know now what usually happens. No, it's, it's not the one thing that made him creative. It's the underlying way of operating that made Anthony so innovative. Because he changed his work while things were still working. He never let stagnation affect his business. It's just how he's always operated. In 2004, he started Razors on this idea that the area needed a traditional style barbershop. And that was refreshing in and of itself. But then competitors started to copy him. And before it became an issue, he changed his services. And as we saw, then he had to go global and find new inspirational sources outside of his market. And a few stale so-so videos became some great videos. But here's the thing. Anthony Shaves the World ended. But his results did not. 
because he plucked out why it was working, while it was still working, the music, and built concerts in his barbershop, the very same concerts he invited me to. But he didn't stop there. Now he has morning brunches where musicians can play, and he also partners with restaurants and bars, bagel shops, you name it. And that showed him the power of partnerships. And before he clung to that too long, he started remixing that. He, he went out of his barbershop, down the street to a bar, brokered a partnership there, and also included the brand Johnny Walker for a night of cuts and cocktails away from his shop to drive people into the shop. That showed him the advantage of going outside your echo chamber, and so he partnered with a hat store and did a pop-up shop back at Razor's. And today, they're even experimenting with comedy shows at a barber shop. Anthony is not doing this to pull random stunts and call it innovation. He's constantly building on what was proven to do something more, deeper, better all the time. He's changing what's working while it's still working. And it's all because he understands that innovation isn't a single event. It's the byproduct of constant discovery. Creativity is an outcome, a thing that people call us while we're constantly discovering new ideas and new ways to take this out into the world all the time. The problem with our random acts of creativity is they are too random. They're sporadic. It's not a sustainable strategy. It's all over the place. It's exhausting. But there is one lesson underneath our random acts of creativity that we can rip out and apply if we want to be more consistent, just like Anthony. Scientists at the University of Edinburgh ran a study that revealed novelty of experience creates long-term memories. Makes sense. This is actually a psychological phenomenon called behavioral tagging. When we are surprised as human beings, we remember both that moment and the moments around it. The surprise and the experience around it get imprinted on our brains, creating an unusually long-lasting memory. This is an evolutionary trait. If our ancestors discovered a patch of berries in the woods, it's rather useful to remember the surprise, the berries, and the walk you took to get there, even if you weren't trying to remember that path consciously on your way there. It's an evolutionary trait. Now, in the study, there's even better news for marketers. They looked at the effects of surprises on students' ability to recall their math lesson in the afternoon. A surprise in the morning, could you remember your math lesson better that afternoon? So you can imagine a scenario now where they bring in LeBron James to speak to the students in the morning, and sure enough, the surprise helped them remember their afternoon lessons far better than the students who had the typical day and did not receive the surprise. Now, best of all, they didn't bring in LeBron James. They didn't pull any big and random stunt. They did not go big. Instead, they just gave the students a surprise music class that they didn't expect. And those students remembered their math lessons far better than the students who didn't get that surprise. And this is huge news for us, because if we're going to be memorable, we don't have to pull a random act of creativity, a giant stunt. In other words, creativity does not mean big. It's devolved into meaning that, but that's actually not what creativity is. Small, refreshing changes are all we need to be memorable. So let's call these small and refreshing changes implemented all the time wrinkles. Wrinkles, small and refreshing changes on the status quo. This means that our problem is not deciding upon the one right giant change to make and calling that innovation. Our problem is we're not making enough changes. The beauty of what Anthony Bariola and Razors does is they're constantly tinkering, constantly exploring, constantly adding new wrinkles to what they do. It's all built off of what's working while it's still working, so they never have to panic and go big. Because innovation doesn't require invention. It's not something from nothing. It requires reinvention. This process of constant and consistent discovery designed to deliver increasingly innovative approaches over time. Marketing today is too obsessed with the first moment in time, the first interaction when people arrive to us, that one thing that we call innovation forever. When people arrive, they carry with them an initial set of expectations. And if you exceed those expectations, great things happen. Because as we've learned, they experience that thrill of novelty, behavioral tagging kicks in, now they have a positive memory, and now profit? We don't really have a plan for what happens after that initial moment, so let's just automate repeat forever. I guess. The problem is one interaction is never enough for anything good to happen. Never. Trust is built over time. Advocacy, that word of mouth we so crave, that starts with ongoing commitment to us. And real relationships with other people, we all know this. It takes time to develop. 
It requires deeper engagement. And right as people start to engage with us more deeply is where we become at risk. As people start to engage with us, great, one moment was awesome, let me explore you more, consume more content, check out the website, follow you on social, subscribe to the newsletter. As people start to engage more deeply, they start to make sense of us. They start to pull out certain traits that imprint on their brains and become that memory that they form. This is a process called identifying anchors. Anchors are the qualities of a project or an entire brand which audiences can recall and we can control. Your favorite podcast, for example, you're not gonna remember every little detail about it. You might think about the host, the cover art, a few key stories they've told, something unique, little wrinkles that they do to format the episode. That forms your memory of it, those anchors. And crucially, when you decide to tell somebody about that podcast, you're passing on the anchors. Identifying anchors. As people start to make sense of something by pulling out those qualities they can recall, they form new expectations of the work. What was once refreshing to them no longer is because they think they've made sense of it. Their expectations have changed. And if our work does not, emotional decay kicks in. But right here, as people start to go deeper with us, is a perfect time to add a little wrinkle, a small but refreshing change on the status quo. If they think they know what to expect, let's give them something small that they didn't, a surprise that they love, a refreshing change on the status quo, a wrinkle. Because then, we've renewed their interest in us because they again experience a thrill of novelty. Behavioral tagging kicks in and they have an even better memory of the experience, more word of mouth, more actions taken. But then again, they start to make sense of us once more and so it's this constant process of adding little wrinkle after little wrinkle. We can train our audience to expect the unexpected from us. Not by pulling giant stunts and calling that innovation, but by making little changes all the time. Because their expectations are changing all the time. Now without fail, teams that master the art of reinvention seem to do so organically. These teams we admire don't seem to halt what they're doing, jump in a room and brainstorm. It's not a new muscle, it just seems to be part of their everyday running, everyday patterns. Their everyday way of operating reveals to them what the anchors are, how that changes people's expectations, then they add a little wrinkle and repeat. They constantly reinvent the work. And so we dub them innovators, we dub them visionaries. But it's just this pattern of every single day in little ways all the time, refreshing the work. And when you study teams that are consistently creative, they all seem to have the same four traits, four behavior traits. They are intrinsically motivated, exploration-minded, momentum-obsessed, and usefully delusional. We'll get there in a second, but let's start with intrinsically motivated. When we are intrinsically motivated, the process of doing the work is its own reward. We're not so obsessed with the end results that we want to do whatever works. What works? Tell me. We want to know why it works. We love the process of doing the work. And in doing so, we get better results. Funny how that works. So teams that are intrinsically motivated, the process is its own reward, they're so focused on the process that they naturally pick up on those anchors. They naturally understand they have a nose for what's growing stale and they proactively reinvent it before it's too late. Anybody who finds joy in the process knows that you can't find joy if the work feels stale. That's what happens when we're intrinsically motivated to do the work. Now the reason so much work is not is because most work becomes telic. Telic means ending oriented, done to a definite end like a chore. I don't care, I got numbers to hit. What works, slap it against my brand, I'll do it, whatever. I just, I wanna skip to the end right now, faster, more, better, immediately. It's telic, it's a chore. The opposite is paratelic. That's when you're moment oriented, seeking to enjoy the experience of doing the work in the here and the now. In other words, intrinsic. And when a task is telic compared to when it's intrinsic, it changes our behavior as marketers. Let me give you two very everyday examples. Let's compare uh, sweeping your floor and eating ice cream. The reason we sweep our floor, is it to enjoy a good sweep? I'd say not. No one is like, honey, 30 more minutes, please, for dinner. I just, I really, I got a good form going here. Look at this new broom, isn't this amazing? I'm loving this. Have you seen these spots on the floor? I can't wait. No, we just wanna skip to the end. So as a result, it changes our behavior. What do we do? We'd rather blink our eyes. We outsource it, we pay someone to do it for us, or we delay it until it becomes so stressful that we panic sweep. Sound familiar? <laughs> But imagine if we love sweeping our floor. We'd probably have cleaner floors. The end result would get better. 
That's what happens with eating ice cream. We're intrinsically motivated by the process, not the end result. No one is like to their friend, like, hey man, um, can, can you just finish my ice cream, please? Yeah, I really just want the dirty bowl. No, we like the process. We eat ice cream in extra large cups, extra large cones with extra large amounts of toppings. Don't even get me started on kitty sizes. Kitty sizes are for quitters. But because we enjoy the process, it's intrinsically motivating, a funny thing happens. We seek it out more, and we find ways to improve it. Interesting. Maybe that's how we can do work that's consistently creative. And when you're intrinsically motivated, when you look hard at the process, you naturally identify the four categories of anchors, four types of identifiable traits in our content that others are picking up on. That if we can deconstruct an experience into these four categories, we make change and reinvention a little bit more knowable. We break it apart, we deconstruct it. There are four categories of anchors. The container, what is it? A speech, a podcast, a brand strategy, an HR process, what is it? Then there's the contents. What goes inside it? How is it made? What's the process to get to a final output? Then there's the purpose. Obviously, change the purpose. What is it for? You change the work. And of course, the most proprietary thing of all, the people. Who does it? Who is working on this? Who are the stakeholders? Who's the target audience? The people. When we deconstruct things and become intrinsically motivating, it makes change a lot easier. That's what Wistia did. Wistia is a video uh, technology company. They sell software for other businesses. And at one point in their career, back when they started the business, around 2013, they were intrinsically motivated to make great videos to promote their brands. Let me give you an example of a video that they were intrinsically motivated to make. Again, this is 2013. Hey, this is Chris from Wistia. I'm about to show you how you can turn a conference room into a video studio. Oh! Shooting in the middle of a busy office can be pretty tricky. And you can't always just make people disappear with a well-executed camera trick. That's what they liked doing. It was intrinsically motivating. They thought, let's put people on camera in B2B content. That was unusual in 2013. It was rather refreshing. They just wanted to make something like that. Let's add a gag as Chris is on camera to make it entertaining. We'll teach you something in our office about turning your conference room into a video studio. But then a funny thing happened. It worked. People loved their videos. So now they have the playbook. So what do we do? Let's beat it to death. They did it again and again and again and again until five years later, they're still making those types of videos and their results stagnated. And so out came the stunts. They doubled their video output, bludgeoning the world with their content. They bought a bunch of drones for drone footage. At one point, they even crafted a parade in front of their office to announce a new product launch. At one point, the Wistia team became so obsessed with manufacturing a near-term spike in the numbers that that team at Wistia, that great creative team, even resorted to banner ads. Sorry. That team even started using banner Hold on. I'm so sorry. This has never happened. That team even started using banner ads. <gasps> oh, I'm sorry. I think I threw up in my mouth a little bit. According to their CEO, Chris Savage, who wrote a tell-all piece about this period of the company, let's get his assessment right here. <laughs> People left the business. They delayed meaningful projects. Nothing was sustainable. It was effort-based, exhausting. It was random acts of creativity 101 because they had made the work telic. It was all about what works. Skip to the end. Do it more and faster, people. They forgot why they do the work. And then the most telic thing that a tech company can receive, an offer to buy the business. Your investors in your tech companies are going to say, hey, what's your exit plan? They're making the work telic from the moment they invest. And they got an offer to sell the business. And they realized, wait, that means we're no longer running the business on our terms. The process of doing this work is why we started. We've forgotten that. And so they took on $17 million in debt from a bank, bought out the investors, declined the buyer, and re-inspired their team. In other words, they changed one of their anchors in the purpose category from near-term term growth to long-term brand affinity. And that re-inspired the team to look hard at the process of why they're doing the work. Not the results, but the process, intrinsic motivation. And they saw all these anchors growing stale. Wow, we keep doing the same old videos, huh? 10 minutes in the office? Let's make original series instead. Let's remix and reinvent and refresh what goes inside those videos and who appears on them. And today, 
they create original series, shows, full produced shows, not with tons of budget, but with tons of joy in the process. Late night shows, talk shows, documentary series. My favorite is Brandwagon. It just launched, and uh, Brandwagon is a late night show, but for marketers. It's hosted by Chris Savage. I want to play you the trailer, but pay careful attention to what the narrator says at the very beginning, because the things he mentioned that they used to do, it's going to sound a little familiar. Here's the trailer for Brandwagon. Three, two, one. From the creators of over 1,200 blog posts that aren't performing as well as they once were. And the team who's as tired of making quippy advertisements as they are of seeing them. From the company that literally designed thousands of paid media assets that were uninspiring to work on and barely moved the needle. And the marketers who know that the number of impressions does not equal the number of people impressed. Comes a brand new show with a brand new strategy in a brand new studio. Introducing Brandwagon. It's like a talk. You get it, and it's great. But I think the greatest thing of all is this simple page on their website. Under their company values, they value long-term company thinking. That's why they do the work. They're intrinsically motivated. Their mission is to make businesses more human, and they will never achieve that mission. They will never see a world where every business is more human, ever. But that's OK, because it's not about the end result for them. It's about the process. And by the way, when you care about the process, a good byproduct is you tend to get some good results. Within one year, they turn the business around from registering 500,000 in losses to 6 million in profits and tens upon tens of millions in total revenues. We can master the art of reinvention if our teams are intrinsically motivated. But we have to make a trade off to get there. We can put our purpose over the profit the process over the end results, because in doing so, we're going to get some great results. Number two, teams that are consistently creative are exploration minded. They have this bias to act. In order to make decisions, they have this preference to gather evidence to inform themselves, not advice. They don't get stuck in theory. They get caught up in the action of it all. But they make those actions less risky. Teams that are exploration minded make creativity feel simple and attainable, not scary, because they make constant wrinkles on the status quo all the time, not giant stunts. The irony of us trying to squeeze the tried and true for all it's worth is we're being risk averse. But all we're doing is pushing off the risk and making it worse in the future because we'll have to go big down there. We'll have to take a bigger risk. Not if we make little changes all the time. That's the power of being exploration minded. So if we go through deconstruction, breaking up an experience into its component anchors, now we have to reinvent those anchors. So what changes are we implementing? Well, let's explore. There are only five small types of changes we can make, five wrinkles. When we talk about creativity, innovation, these big ideas, these ephemeral notions, all we're talking about are these five actions at our disposal. This is the one we do most often. You can reuse something. Increase the number of times people encounter that anchor in the same project. People love your podcast host, give her a monologue. More of that host for the audience. Reuse what's working. You can repurpose. We do this a little bit too as content marketers. That's increase the number of times people encounter the anchor in a different project. People love your podcast host, she hosts a video show. She emcees your event. You can repurpose an anchor. Then you can replace one very simply, substitute an anchor that's not working or growing stale for another anchor. Bad news, Sally, uh, we're, we're getting a new host for our show. Sorry, we're replacing you. It happens. We can remix it. The anchor is working, or it just has to stay. We have stakeholders. It can't budge. So let's add refreshing new elements to it. We're going to do a collaboration on our show. We'll do a mini-series with another brand that's remixing the podcast. Or we can refine something that's taking an anchor and whittling away, removing what's not working, or even the entire thing. That lightning round of questions we always ask our guests at the end. Everybody's doing it. People don't seem to like it. The episodes are running long. Let's cut it. These are the five changes we can make. And the team at Lessonly did all five. Lessonly is, uh, they sell video, or sorry, uh, training software for internal teams, customer support teams, sales teams, based in Indianapolis. And they hold a very refreshing annual conference in Indy. And they use all five wrinkles to get there. The first thing they did was they reused something. They understand that their brand is about one mo emotion in particular, a sense of belonging. They don't sell how-tos and knowledge. They sell a sense of belonging. Because they sell to small teams, L&D teams. 
And whenever they talk to their customers, they hear the same emotion come out. Oh my God, finally, you get my job. I work for a small department here. No one knows what I do as a trainer. You're my people. So they sell the sense of belonging as a brand. So why not reuse it? They named their event Yellowship, like fellowship. Learn together, win together. We can reuse an anchor that's working. Then we can repurpose something. This is Kyle Lacey, VP of Marketing at Lessonly. Here he is in his garage at home, spray painting 700 toy llamas gold. That's pretty crazy. The reason is they use those llamas in their direct mail to prospects. And they can't stop hearing about how much people love these random little toys. And so they repurposed it. If you go to Yellow Shop, you'll find the llama is everywhere at the event. His name is Ali, Ali Llama. <laughs> nice. Yeah. They repurposed, increased the number of times you encounter an anchor in a different project, plucking it out from direct mail, putting it on their conference. Then you can replace an anchor. Most of us have these like cocktail hours in mind when we hear networking at an event. Lessonly heard feedback, that's not great for introverts. It's also not great for making meaningful connections. So they re replaced some of their open-ended cocktail hours with more uh, like named introductions. You'd sit at a table with themes and actually get to meet people proactively. It was more concerted efforts to forge that sense of belonging. So they replaced an anchor. Second to last, number four, they remix something. That's to add new and refreshing elements to an anchor we're all aware is growing stale. This is what they did to their vendors out on the expo floor. Now, whether you've run a booth or you've walked by a booth, we all know what happens, right? Attendees leave a talk like this, go out to the floor, and everybody running a booth goes, oh, attendees are here. Are you going to talk to me? No. Are you going to talk to me? No. Ye yes? Oh, uh, bathroom's that way. We all know this goes on, right? And so they remixed it. You have to have that floor. You can't replace it. Why don't we remix it? Let's add a game element, a little map that attendees receive. And if you talk to somebody, you get a stamp at their booth, and you could cash in for prizes at the end. They remixed it so it didn't grow stale. And lastly, you can replace, or excuse me, refine. You can whittle down something or remove the entire thing. And the thing they refined was the speaker agenda. Lots of us went to college. Did we take six classes all in a row? No, but why do these events have back to back to back to back to back to back to back? Why? We all know this is stressful. It's exhausting. It's hard to pay attention. They understood that. It's growing stale. It's reached the crapping point. So why don't we reinvent that anchor? Let's refine it. They have fewer speakers, but better ones with more gap time in between. Amazing. Look, innovative work isn't plucked from thin air. It's a big idea, creativity, but it's practical. It's just the sum of lots of small changes, little wrinkles, specifically one or more of these five. Choose one, do them all, just don't do nothing. We can master the art of reinvention if we become exploration-minded. But the trade-off we have to make is to put action, little action, not big stunts, over theory. Don't try to gather up all the answers you need to act. Act to find your answers. Number three, momentum obsessed. This is building on top of what's going well, changing what's working while it's still working so that your results compound over time. Teams that are momentum obsessed don't get so excited about every win that they stop trying, nor do they get so depressed over every loss. In other words, they don't care about the spikes, the peaks, the valleys. They care about the trajectory of the entire line. They care about the body of work. Now, I had to look this up because English major, I don't know if you remember from physics, but uh, momentum equals mass times velocity. We're really good at talking about velocity. We love talking about that in business today. Not so good with mass. I don't mean more budget or people or resources. I mean the work you amass. To get great at something, we just have to be bad at it for a little while, but we gotta put in the reps. Or to do something others deem big, what we're really doing is filing away lots of small choices that add up to what others think is huge. But we know the truth. We're just building momentum. The team at Metro Trains in Melbourne, Australia, is famous for building momentum. Well, they're famous for a video. What people don't realize is the momentum actually determined its success. They created a safety message that people love. It's called Dumb Ways to Die. It happened several years ago. Many people are nodding. It's one of the most famous campaigns of all time. Just so we're all on the same page, let me show you a brief little clip of Dumb Ways to Die. Set fire to your hair Poke a stick at a grizzly bear Eat medicine that's out of date Use your private parts as piranha bait Everybody! Dumb, dumb ways to die. die So many dumb ways to die Dumb ways to die So many dumb ways to die 
raise your hand if you've come across this content before. Yeah, lots of you. It's, again, one of the most popular videos, popular marketing examples ever. It went crazy viral even in just the first few days it was live. It got the you know, requisite number of press hits that brought in the reach and exposure. It's actually been given more awards for advertising excellent, excellence than any campaign in history. Let me just show you a list of every award that Dumb Ways to Die has won. Okay, every award that they've won. But it's not the one thing that made them creative. It's not the one thing that made them successful. It's how they built momentum from there. The first thing they did was they repurposed the song onto iTunes before it was Apple Music, and it charted top 10 in 28 countries worldwide. That's the song right there, just under Gangnam Style. <laughs> it's a safety message. They created plush toys and all kinds of merchandise and clothing that you could buy. Uh, they had local events in Australia with kids singing the songs and bringing cupcakes with the characters. They create tons of mobile games even still through today. This is a screenshot of a bunch of mobile games. These games are owned and operated by a subway system. What a time to be alive. And then the community got hold of it and they remixed the song endlessly. Dumb Ways to Die in Game of Thrones, in Lego, in Minecraft. Thousands of remixes community built exist on YouTube. And of course, the Dumb Ways to Die team got in on it. They started doing a holiday series, Dumb Ways to Die on Valentine's Day, on Easter, on Halloween. And of course, Dumb Ways to Die on Christmas. Deck the halls with boughs of holly. Dum, 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 dum. <laughs> That will be in your head all damn day. But it's not the one thing that made them so successful. Yes, they got a bunch of reach from that one video, but reach isn't enough. We need resonance. And to get resonance, we need momentum. Constant changes on the status quo, changing what's working while it's still working so we never grow stale. I think some of the best results among these massive numbers, they dropped their risky behavior around trains by 20% in the first two years and serious injuries by 68%. Perhaps most impressive if you're building momentum over the years, 67%, uh, two out of every three kids engage with that content. It's an unbelievable runaway success. And I think building momentum requires this relentless optimism that you can keep going and do more and get better all the time. Most teams start with what's broken, what's the problem, then they try to fix it. It's reacting all the time, putting out fires. But innovative teams start with what's working and then they reinvent it. They build on top of what's working while it's still working. So we can master the art of reinvention if we become momentum obsessed. And to do that, we have to look for the positives, not the negatives, and build on it constantly. We have to have that relentless optimism. Okay, let's put it all together, right? To consistently reinvent first, deconstruction. Start by taking content, an experience, your entire brand, and categorizing all the anchors that you hear from customers that you intrinsically know go on, that people identify with, into the four categories. Next, from deconstruction, you have exploration. How are we going to reinvent these things? There's only five changes we can make. They're small, not risky. So what are we going to do? Let's talk about it, let's experiment with it, and then implementation. Create a change, not a giant stunt, a small little wrinkle, a refreshing change on the status quo. And then, of course, crucially, aeration. How did it do? Are you hearing from your audience? Does anybody actually care? Because then you know you've found your innovation. And I wanted to call this thing something like self-important. I was feeling pretty good after I put this slide together. I'm not going to lie. I wanted to call this like the pyramid of innovation. 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 Thanks for the effect. Uh, just one problem, though. See that little piece at the top? Yeah, that doesn't exist. That's a fantasy. It's a myth. We will never find that one innovation. Might as well go searching for a unicorn on, right, with a leprechaun on the back on a rainbow. It does not exist. It's just this constant cycle of reinventing the work all the time, from deconstruction onwards. So we can't call it the pyramid of innovation. Let's call it the triangle of trying stuff. Because that's all we're doing. We're just constantly trying stuff over and over and over again. So we build momentum. We're constantly reinventing the work. Their expectations always change. So our work needs to change too. And if your work is predicated on constantly trying stuff without the understanding that it definitely will work, it's rather helpful if your team can be usefully delusional. <laughs> this is the confidence to act as if. Not only can we, we will. 
To quote Anthony Bourdain again, he says that when you create something, there's something rather monstrous about being creative, because you're expecting to put something out in the world that people respond to positively. They invest time and resources into. That's rather monstrous. That's rather crazy. So we need to be a little delusional to do it. I'm not saying let your ego out of the cage, but you know, let it paw at the world a little bit. And the reason I think we should do that, as with all good things, lies with pizza. But not just any pizza, Sally's Pizza. Sally's is this little hole in the wall joint in New Haven, Connecticut, about 10 minutes from my hometown where I grew up, and it's amazing pizza. Down the street, two blocks away, is their biggest peer, their biggest competitor, Pepe's. Now, Sally's and Pepe's are both ranked nationally every year for excellent pizza, and Sally's and Pepe's both hate the other business. They're like the Red Sox and Yankees of local pizza. I am a Sally's guy, my family's a Sally's family, we always will be, you can't convince me otherwise. Sally's is the best pizza on planet Earth. That's my team. And when I was a kid, I would go and get the same waiter every time. His name was Lorenzo, big burly guy. He used to actually swim for Yale University, and when he graduated Yale, an Ivy League school down the street, he went to work for Sally's Pizza. Why? Because he wants to work in heaven. <laughs> and when I was little, I asked him a very snarky question, and he humored me but he gave me an answer I didn't expect. I said, hey, Lorenzo, uh, Pepe's down the street, they make pizza, you make pizza, how are you any different? Little shit that I was. <laughs> Lorenzo humored me though, and he goes, well, we both have access to the same cheese, we both have access to the same sauce, and we both have access to the same toppings, but the secret is the starter. The starter is a very simple mixture of flour and water, and it forms the basis for making great dough. There are two ways to affect your starter, exposure and time. You can expose it to different containers you put it in, light, heat, different temperatures. Some people put some, some fruit drops in it, and then you let it ferment over time. Some people who, like Sally's, take baking very seriously, they've used the same starter for decades, like 50 plus years. They've been building this starter and using it, it's insane. Some people love their starter so much, they even give it a name, it's like a pet that lives with them. Now, I don't have a starter in my house, but if I did, I already know the name I'm gonna give it. <laughs> oh yeah. And thanks to all the things that a starter has been exposed to and all the time it takes to ferment, as a result, no two starters make the same dough. So that's how Sally's can be refreshing compared to their biggest competitor not two blocks away. So what does this have to do with our work of being consistently creative? Well, I think thanks to everything you've been exposed to and all the time it's been taking you to become who you are, you are the starter. And so when Sally's has to do something that seems impossible, they have to innovate and beat their competitor, not two blocks away. They have to do something crazy. It's pizza, we all have access to the same toppings, the same cheese, the same sauce. They have to do that impossible thing. The most important ingredient they have access to is the starter. And when our jobs seem impossible too, we have to make creativity consistent, not a stunt, not random acts of creativity. It has to become a habit, not a Hail Mary. When our jobs seem that impossible, the most important ingredient we have access to is the starter, is you. You are the starter. And no two starters make the same dough. Look, creativity is not a stunt. It's not a campaign or a moment or a piece of content and it's certainly not a technology. This whole presentation has been about one thing, people. People who make choices. Not at a conference, not in theory, every day back at work. So when we all go home and the feeling of this event has long faded, we choose to work this way because we wanna do work that we love more consistently until it becomes a way of operating. Is it delusional to think we can make creativity consistent? Maybe, maybe. It's not always a great idea to follow your passion. Maybe it's not a great idea to change what's working while it's still working. But if you feel in your heart, if you know, if you have reason to believe that you can be awesome at something, that you can do something unique that will shock, astound, and bewitch people, I'm begging you through little wrinkles, all the time, do that. Thank you so much, and keep in touch.